Good morning. Our lesson for today is entitled, Need for Just Leaders. Just in the sense of fair, impartial, even-handed, righteous. We have a need for those kinds of leaders. I do thank God for this day. Our lesson for this morning is taken from Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, also chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. So if you have your Bibles, you can join along with me. Lesson aims include promoting the reading and the understanding of God's Word, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, to provide a brief overview of the book of Malachi to discuss the significance of obeying God, the importance of obeying God, and returning to God's teachings, to pray that religious leaders everywhere would teach and obey the Word of God. For devotional reading, consider Psalm number 50, verses 1 through 15. And some of the insights that I glean from this passage is that God will judge his people. Also, we should be thankful to God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 reminds us, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything give thanks. So we have for all things given thanks and in all things given thanks. And I repeat those references, Ephesians 5, 20, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. Also, another thought that I glean from Psalm number 50 is that we should pay our vows to God. Songwriter simply says, I made a vow to the Lord and I won't take it back. We can call upon God in the day of trouble, beloved, and uh, he will deliver us. The memory verse for this lesson is Malachi chapter 2, verse 2. If you will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Wow. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Malachi is the last prophetic message from God before the close of the Old Testament period. Not much is known about the author other than his name. This book of Malachi emphasizes the message rather than the messenger, since out of a total of 53 verses, as many as 47 verses are the personal addresses of the Lord. Malachi presents Judah's sins largely on the people's own lips, quoting their words, thoughts, and attitudes. Malachi was faced with the failure of the priests of Judah to fear the Lord and to serve the Lord and the people of God conscientiously during difficult times. This neglect had contributed to Judah's indifference toward the will of God blaming their economic and social troubles on the Lord's supposed unfaithfulness to them. The people were treating one another faithlessly, especially their wives, and were profaning the temple by marrying pagan women. They were also withholding their tithes from the temple. Malachi called the people to turn from their spiritual apathy and correct their wrong attitudes about worship and trusting God with genuine faith as their living Lord. This included honoring the Lord's name with pure offerings, being faithful to covenants made with fellow believers, especially marriage contracts, and signifying their repentance with tithes. If the priests will not alter their behavior, the Lord will curse them, shame them, and remove them from service. Malachi also announces a coming day when the Lord of justice will come to purge and refine his people. At that time, he will make evident the distinction between the obedient and the wicked and will judge the wicked. 
from the uh, summarized Bible, I see these thoughts uh, concerning chapters 2 and 3 of Malachi. We read that the message to the priests is concerning their sins and also the evils among the people. Also in this summarized Bible, the author says, Woe to those appointed to be God's mouth to the people, but who instead are a stone of stumbling. All who rest in external performances of religion will not only come short of acceptance with God in them, but be, it will be filled with shame and confusion. The summarized Bible also concludes that those who deny God his part of their estates may justly expect a curse upon their own part of them. Those who rob God themselves of his benefits are also robbing God and things that would come their way. Now look at this verse 1 as it starts out. To whom is this book addressed? And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Look at that again. O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Now, knowing that, I raise the question, how are you fulfilling your duties as a priest or as a religious leader? Are you doing what God called you to do? I don't know. Uh, that's a time for you to reflect on that particular element, that particular portion of your calling. But I do, know, do raise the question, are you called of God? How do you know that God calls you? And how do you know that you're fulfilling the call to which God has told you to work? See, God called priests and prophets in the Old Testament to do his will, to declare, thus saith the Lord. Now, when we recognize that God has called us, we also look at requirements for religious leaders. You can read those in your own leisure, but take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Take a look at Titus 1, 1 through 9. And then recognize that we as religious leaders have really a strong obligation to live holy, righteously, to do what thus saith the word of the Lord. In other words, God has standards, and we need to have respect for God and for his standards. This verse 2 says, If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Ye I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. I will cause and invoke divine harm or evil upon you and your blessings. Those things, blessings are those things that which bring a prosperity, which bring life. And God is declaring here, if you don't do right, amen, I will send a curse upon you. I'll curse your blessings. Beloved, we need to re believe the report. Isaiah chapter, chapter 53 reminds us, who hath believed our report? Amen. Beloved, we need to honor God, honor God's name, amen, and recognize that God has called us to be his witnesses in uh, this day and time. But what does he say? Lay it to heart. Consider, give careful thought or consideration, amen, our, in our mind and in our uh, very inner being, in our innermost being. Let us consider what thus saith the word of the Lord. The concept of hearing includes both not this auditory uh, uh, process, but also obedient. And so when we hear God saying hear, he is saying receive it through the auditory senses and then actively obey what he has declared that we should do. Now, uh, given this unparalleled, unprecedented pandemic, then the question is, uh, are these afflictions causing us to return to God? If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. You have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. 
have you believed God's report? Amen. And so then, if that is the case, and uh, as a teacher, I, I love giving insi- assignments, I would say something like, develop an action plan that will bring us back to God. Think about it. What could bring us back to God? Think about it some of the empty worship in which we have been involved. Think about putting more emphasis upon the things of man than upon the things of God. Think about passages like 16, 15 of Luke. Amen. Those things which are highly esteemed by men are an abomination unto the Lord. Think about vying and jockeying for positions and fame and power and influence and affluence rather than seeking the Lord while he may be found and calling upon him while he is near. So my question would be, is this pandemic causing us to say yes to God? Is it causing us to say, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me, amen, and make me after thy will. While I'm waiting, yielding and still. So is this serious plague, affliction, not upon just one element of society, but this worldwide pandemic, all the people upon all the people, does not uh, matter our status in life. Is it causing us to return back to God? And then he continues, God continues in verse 3. He says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. Now, dung is awful. It's viscera. It's the tremens of a butchered animal, often you know, considered inedible uh, by uh, uh, humans. Uh, it's excrement. It's fecal matter. Uh, God says, I will spread dung upon your faces. Amen. He also says, I will corrupt your, your seed. Uh, I'll rebuke, I will censor severely and angrily. Amen. I'll tell another that they've done wrong with conviction or zeal. Amen. I will imply a disapproval and a straining of a relationship. I will corrupt your seed. And, and, and not only that, we recognize that uh, we can, on the one hand, fall away from God, but somebody said, thank God for Jesus. We can also be reconciled unto God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. We can be reconciled unto God. We can have peace in every area of our life. It does not matter where we are found, but beloved, if we just seek the Lord, call upon him, we can have peace in every area of our life. This verse 3, once again, let me read it again. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. In other words, carry you off, remove you from a certain place or environment conceived of as lifting up or carrying, carting off. So thinks in, in terms of, amen, people being exiled, being uh, deported from their normal place of habitation into other strange areas. Verse 4 says, And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, and uh, saith the Lord of hosts. Ye shall know. You're going to be aware. You know a specific piece of information. Now, uh, God gives us covenants. Amen. Contractual agreements, arrangements, amen, between himself, amen, and, and his people. God has made, made covenants, and he says, I've sent this commandment with you that my, my covenant may be with Levi. Levi, the third son of Jacob by Leah. Levi, the ancestor of the tribe of, of Levi, which was set apart for the service of the sanctuary. Levites were to transport, to erect, to guard the temple. You can read about the Levites in Numbers uh, chapter 1, particularly uh, verses 48 through 43. So God expresses, amen, that God has made an agreement with his people. And and let me just hurry up and say that our God is a covenant-keeping God. God loves his people. God honors God's word. 
So then, with God being a covenant-keeping God, God established a covenant with Noah. God said, you know, I put this rainbow here. And every time it rains, I say, thank God for the rainbow. God establishes his covenant with Abraham. Amen. And Abraham having off seed, uh, as, as innumerable as the stars in heaven and sands on the seashore. Uh, God is a covenant-keeping God. Sometimes we sing a song about Father Abraham has lots of sons, and I'm one of them, and, and so are you. We appreciate God having established a covenant with Abraham, and God continues, amen, to honor his covenant. So then, because God honors God's covenant, we might ask ourselves, what is the message, even right now, in uh, this uh, pandemic? What is the message that God is sending to us, that God has given to his people? I think one is, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Our God is loving God. Let me reread verse 4 again. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Let us magnify God. Let us continue to say yes to God. Read in verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Do we fear God? Or have we lost a fear of God? Has our fear of God diminished? You know, I'm talking about this love and respect and the considering the awesomeness of God and who God is. I mean, God is the one said who said, Barashit Barai Elohim. God is the one who said, uh, you know, created everything that exists. Amen. Uh, he created the heaven, the earth, and uh, he's the one whom the psalmist says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness are of the world. Amen. And, and they that dwell therein. And so if we have a covenant of life and peace, but what does fear in God really look like? I think one thing God is uh, speaking to me and I hope to uh, even more than just uh, to uh, me, that uh, God wants us to honor him in spirit and in truth. God wants us to respect him in every area, in every arena of our lives. But uh, there are things that will pull us away from God and cause us not to fear God and cause us to engage in empty ceremonial practices, so much so that uh, we can get caught up in traditional kinds of things and, and, and really seek the approval of man, mankind, rather than seeking uh, the approval of God. But when we do not fear God, beloved, there are consequences for our not fearing God. When God tells us to go in one direction and we go in another direction, uh, we have a free will. One writer wrote about the risky business of free will. So we have a free will, and we can go uh, in a different direction from that which God has ordered us to go, but then there are consequences. So we must consider what are the possible consequences for our not fearing God. And again, I would say something like, uh, put together an action plan that would cause us to fear reverence God, and then begin to share this plan uh, with people with whom we've found. I think we've gotten very comfortable with uh, not sharing people with people about God, who God is, God's glory, and God's honor. Verse true, verse uh, six. Law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. Somebody like Pilate might say, what is truth? Well, the law of truth was in his mouth. Amen. Truth is the, uh, that which is dependable, it's trustworthy, it's honesty, it's genuineness, it's integrity, veracity. All of these uh, components of truth. We, uh, right now, are living in an epoch where people will lie and instead of saying that they lied, we'll say that they misspoke or you know, perjured themselves. But we need to be firm advocates of promoting the truth. 
Now the law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his uh, lips. There's no wickedness, no injustice, no wrong, no unrighteousness uh, in, his, in his lip. When you look there in that specified place, uh, it was not there. He walked with me in peace and equity. Beloved, there are moral standards, and we need to conform to them. God is the one who is righteous and loving and holy, and God is the one who said, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. There are moral standards of uprightness and rectitude and fairness, and God expects us, amen, to walk according to his dictates. And he wants us to walk, to move about, <clears throat> excuse me, in a specified manner. And then if I could, they say, well, Reverend, now you're meddling. If I could meddle just a little bit, uh, just for reflection, describe your current walk with God. And then as a follow-up, I would say something like, uh, not only describe your current walk with God, but what changes, if any, do you need to make in your lifestyle? Maybe you're happy with what you're doing and how things are going in your life. I'm just raising the question for reflection. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. He caused people to stop doing evil. He helped people to stop doing evil. So this day and time, amen, uh, describe and think about your influence of moving people away from negative lifestyles into a positive relationship with our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. God wants us to share this message of love, redemption, salvation, reconciliation, restoration, amen, peace in Christ Jesus uh, with a dying world. Look at verse 7. It says, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge. Whoa. Well, I could just spend a lot of time right there. The priest's lips should keep knowledge. The priest's lips should maintain knowledge. The priest's lips should guard knowledge. The priest's lips should preserve knowledge. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and <clears throat> they should seek the law at his mouth. For, ooh, look at this uh, uh, next part. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. As priests, as religious leaders, beloved, we are somebody. Amen. The priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Amen. The one who created the entire universe. And then the one who said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. This one who is the giver of life, who breathed into our man's uh, nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are messengers of the Lord of hosts. Amen. We are messengers of God. Amen. Uh, Adonai, Yahweh, Saboah, the Lord of armies, God has... Amen. Legions upon legions of armies there in heaven to do his bidding. And uh, he, the Lord of hosts, wants a relationship with us, with his people. And then, since we as priests are messengers of God, people ought to be able to come to us and get a word from God. And again, I refer you back to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And, and then, you know, you can identify... If a person is a true messenger of God, some people will come up saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. But look at Deuteronomy, for example, chapter 18, verses 21 and uh, 22. Because there will be false uh, teachers and false prophets coming out, but then we can check, amen, and see if they really are from God. Verse 8, But ye are departed out of the way, You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of the Levites, saith the Lord of hosts. You turn aside. People will commit apostasy. You turn your backs on me. You stopped obeying me. You've left God's paths. This last week, I preached 
Second Chronicles chapter 7, and you can find it on Facebook in English, Spanish, French, and Italian. And the message is, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their lands. But ye departed out of the way. Amen. Because if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. See there. Uh, if I command the locusts to devour the land. If I send pestilence among my people. See, that's where we are right now. Amen. This pestilence, whatever the name might be, this particular pestilence, worldwide and its impact, having us locked up, sequestered, uh, sheltered in place, you name it. But it has impacted our way of life. Well, but you departed out of the way. You caused many to stumble at the law. You corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. So remember in verse 1, we're talking about to the religious leaders. You are departed out of the way. And not only that, you caused many to stumble. You led others to do sinful things. You use the teachings of God's word to make people do wrong. Uh, your teaching has messed up many lives, caused many to violate the law. That's what the Lord is saying to us, amen, the re uh, religious leaders. And so you corrupted, you violated, you broken, you ruined, you distorted, amen. You messed up the message of love, redemption, and salvation that I have given unto you. So God issues a strong indictment in this book of Malachi, amen, to the priests. And again, let me read this verse 8 before I move on. But you have departed out of the way. You caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. There's been stumbling. There's been unfaithfulness to God. But once again, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And since we've done those things, he's, God says, Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. I have also made you contemptible. I mean, you're despised now. You look down upon with uh, disdain and uh, possibly hatred. I've made you base. I've made you lower, inferior in station or in quality. And not only that, I did it before everyone. Therefore, I have also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways. Amen. You have not remained in a certain position. You didn't stay where you should have stayed. You didn't obey the way that you should have obeyed. You are not keeping. You have not followed. You have not kept my ways. And then it says, but you've been partial. You've had respect to persons. You fail to treat all people alike. You're showing favoritism. You ever come to a crowded worship service and try to get a seat? Now, if you're head of the mop committee, people will uh, meet you at the door and usher you right up on in. But let your name be John Doe. And it's like, sit ye here at my feet. Or we don't have anything uh, for you right now. You're showing partiality in the administration of justice. Ever seen someone, amen, do wrong? However, because of their particular name, their particular pedigree, as it were, they had a slap on the hand. But then when you did wrong, they like knocked you out. Why? Because of partiality, because of favoritism, because of people not doing what thus said the word of the Lord. God says, I've also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you've not kept my ways, but have been impartial in the law. God wants us to love people regardless as to where they are found. Now, after this verse 9, this particular lesson goes to Malachi chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. So let's read verse 5. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, 
the widow, the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord. I mean, there are uh, diviners out. I mean, uh, there are people who are out there trying to use magical spells uh, to harness evil uh, forces or spirits and uh, to uh, produce unnatural effects in the world. We got these kinds of people uh, in the world. There are people who are adulterers. They are having a sexual intercourse with someone, amen, who is not their uh, spouse. Uh, there are uh, swearers and those who are promising solemnly, and they usually are invoking a divine witness regarding future acts or behaviors, often including penalties if they fail within the context of that particular oath. So these, these are your swearers, and I will come near to you, God says, in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. God wants us to fear him. God is a great God. He is awesome. God is loving. Amen. God is sovereign. God's in charge. Amen. Not only that, the old folk would say God, God rules, and he super rules. But for somehow, there has arisen a generation. Judges chapter 2 and 10, for example. There has arisen a generation that, that knows not God. And so we don't regard God with uh, feelings of respect and reverence. But I think during this pandemic, a lot of us, I, I, don't, I, I won't say that all of us, but a lot of us are going to begin to seek a stronger relationship with God, recognizing that if I have fame and influence, affluence, these kinds of things, if I have worldly possessions, all of that, really what matters is my relationship with God. And, and I'm, I'm quite sure that as we go through uh, this uh, period of history, that we will begin, a lot of us, to have a stronger relationship with the Lord. You see, God is judging the behavior of, of his people. And, and, and God is saying, be ye holy, for I am holy, saying the Lord. Amen. God expects us to exhibit righteous, amen, behavior. God expects us to honor and love him and have respect uh, for him, amen. God wants us to acknowledge that God, not man, is sovereign. I mean, we have, you know, uh, hundreds of nations around the world and leaders in every one of those nations, and sometimes uh, because we are the leader, uh, we can become a little arrogant. Well, now, I pray for our leaders all around the world, both our political and our ecclesiastical leaders, but recognize that God is in charge. It is God who puts kings and presidents into power, and it's God who uh, takes them out again. And so uh, when we look, amen, at this verse 5, we should not oppress God's people, amen. We should not abuse the, uh, the authority that has been given, amen, unto us, there is oppression occurring on so many different levels within our society. But remember, that even the ones who are doing the uh, oppressing, they also have to give an honor, uh, give an account of their actions under God. Amen. Uh, we should handle the finances and the resources, amen, of those who are working, amen, for us in a proper manner. And a lot of the terrible sweatshop working kinds of conditions around the world so that we can have a brand name product beloved this ought not to be there are defenseless people within our area and, and you can look around there there's a group there there's a group over there so then how are we dealing with these individuals reminding ourselves now that it's malachi three and five what god has to say and i will come near to you to judgment and i will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless. See, God's on the side, amen, of, of those who cannot help themselves. And they turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, save the Lord of hosts. Amen. There are people who uh, do, don't belong to our particular group, or our nation through uh, ancestry, these kinds of things. And uh, we will lead people into a behavior that's to their detriment, uh, leading them away from a planned path. 
God is not pleased with this kind of behavior uh, on our, our behalf. So we might ask ourselves, how does our society deal with the stranger that's in our midst? God's going to call us into account for our behavior. Amen. I mean, how do, how do we deal with the stranger, the foreign in our midst? But then compare that with how does God desire that we deal with them? Now, if, and I think it has, our respect for God has diminished. Again, it's a recurring theme here. What can we do to promote a renewed love, respect for God, for his glory, for his honor, for his majesty? Now, look what God says here in verse 6, and this is our last verse in this lesson. For I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Thank God for immutability. Amen. One of God's character traits. Thank God for his unchangeableness. I am the Lord. Anoki Adonai. Uh, and so, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen. I do not become different in essence. I do not lose my original nature, is what God is saying. Amen. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob. Amen. Uh, Jacob, the male grandson of Abraham, uh, named you know, Israel. Uh, Jacob, the one who is the father of the, you know, the 12 tribes. I change not, is what God is saying. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob uh, are not consumed. You've not been brought to a finish. You've not been brought to an end. Because God is a covenant-keeping God. And God made a covenant. Amen. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of my parents and your parents. Amen. He's our God. And we want him to be our children's God. Amen. But God is a covenant-keeping God. And I thank God for his immutability. Because his immutability, his not changing, gives us hope. It makes me want to uh, wrap back and sing. In fact, later on today. I've got all of these songs you know, running through my mind. And so a little bit later today, I'll, I'll be uh, singing from different songs. Be looking just a few minutes at Psalm number 137, verses 1 through 4. That fourth verse says, how shall we sing in a strange land? This pandemic has us in a strange land. But I just feel like singing, even in the midst of adversity. So in a little bit, a few hours later today, uh, I shall, uh, the Lord said the same, sing in uh, English and Spanish and French and Italian and German. Just uh, God put these songs on my mind and I want to uh, do that. Now, because God is immutable, because God does not change, one song that pops in my mind is that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand so in the midst of this pandemic my beloved all other ground is sinking sand but God does not change for I am the Lord I change not therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed so because God does not change we have a glorious future we can say things like Though the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved. I mean, I got another building. A house not made by hands. Eternal in the heaven. Because God does not change from everlasting to everlasting. You know, he's God before the mountains were brought forth. Ever thou didst form the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. I know that we have a glorious future. Because God does not change. Then uh, the, the Psalms one, uh, Psalm 23, for example. We, we read, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Another translation says in uh, English, Jehovah is my pastor. Nothing shall be lacking unto me. Another translation in the Spanish language says uh, that Heva uh, es uh, mi uh, pastor, nada me faltará. Hebrew version says, uh, reminds us that Adonai roi lo exar, you know, Jehovah shepherd, you know, is my shepherd. Nothing will be lacking un unto me. So then, knowing that, I've got a glorious future. I know that God is a covenant-keeping God. 
that God keeps his promises, that God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. And I know that when I trust God, I'm, I'm on a solid foundation. Again, don't build your house on a sandy land. Don't build them too near the shore. Oh, it may be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. You'll have to build your house once more. So then we build our house upon the rock because God is a promise-keeping, a covenant-keeping God, and he does not change. Now, I'll, I'll close out, but I've got these songs running through my mind. I can't sing them now, but songs like Every Word of God is Right, Hallelujah to His Name, songs like How Great Thou Art, Songs like, I will trust in the Lord, and uh, and, and, and particularly in this next song, Jesus getting us ready for that great day. This pandemic really is calling us back to God. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Who shall be able to stand? And then here comes a song, uh, Lord, send a revival. Uh, I'll probably sing that one later on today and uh, kind of a counterpart of that song saying, Yah, 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 ye go to viva mento. Amen. And uh, in uh, uh, the uh, Spanish languages I sing later on today. And then, open my eyes. There's another song that I may see. Uh, look at uh, the pandemic and what's going on and sheltering in place and being safe and taking care of yourself and your family and your loved ones. But also ask God uh, to open our eyes as the prophet asked that God would open the eyes of the, of the servant. And then behold, they that are for us. Amen. The angels of God. Amen. The messengers of God. Amen. Those who are ready to do God's building had the enemy surrounded. So ask God to open our eyes that we might see. Uh, there are songs that we'll be able to testify about coming out of this pandemic that the Lord delivered me one day. Why should I be bound? Songs like they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I'll tell you another song that hit my spirit uh, considering this pandemic. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. You know time is winding up. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. Time, time, time. Time is winding up. You know time is winding up. I'll close out by saying that it's my desire at 5 a.m. each Sunday morning Pacific time uh, to go through this Sunday school lesson. Also, I've written my own notes on these lessons for the last 10 or 11 years now. And if you would like to receive my weekly emails, uh, my email address is there on the screen, MosesHarris at AOL.com. Uh, send me your email address and I'll put you on my weekly mailing list. God bless you. I thank you for spending this time with me as we looked at this particular lesson. And as we move into the coming week, recognize that God always has a word for us and for his people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land. Love you. Have a good day. Bye.